Our scripture this morning is from 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So hear the word of the Lord. In your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Look who the Lord you've been. sixth grade, and I think it's remarkable that they have the courage to be on stage at all. I didn't have that at their age, and I think that's pretty incredible. They're really young. They're going to be together for several more years, and so uh, also, if you want to be a part of the youth band, uh, please, uh, we need more instrumentalists. We need more singers. We'll take anyone. We'll make the band as big as it can be. Uh, we, just, we just love having these youth on stage, and so, so proud of those kids. But today, today I want to speak to you about invisible forces. Forces that work in the world that we can't see, and maybe we don't even know are there. But they are moving. And I want to begin in a dorm room with a young man who's beginning his junior year. And he goes to his first class of the year, and he sits in the back. And there in the front row, he sees a beautiful girl, the most beautiful girl he's ever seen. And he begins to stare at her. He can't focus. He becomes infatuated with her. He goes back to his dorm room and he tells his roommate, I just saw the most beautiful girl in the world. He goes back to class the next time. He sees her again. And over and over again, he comes back to his room and he says, Russ, this girl, I can't quit thinking about her. And I say, well, have you talked to her yet? Oh, no, 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 not yet. Not yet. I'm going to one day. And then one day he's sitting in class and he hears her speak. She answers a question and he realizes that she is also smart. And he goes back to his dorm room and he says, well, she is also really smart. I said, well, maybe you should talk to her. <laughs> no, no, not yet, not yet. But one, one day I'll do that. And then one day he's sitting in class and, and while he's staring at her, as was his head, uh, he realized one day that she was staring back at him which prompted him to go back to his dorm room and tell me that she was staring back at him. Now, I didn't say it at the time, but I thought, maybe she's staring at you because you are staring at her. <laughs> Just a thought. Well, I went to Campbell University, and if you're not from North Carolina, Campbell University is in Bowie's Creek. Now, Bowie's Creek is as small as it sounds. If Bowie's Creek was on TripAdvisor, the number one rated thing to do would be Walmart, just, just Walmart, which is about 15 miles away. And so I remember distinctly one Thursday evening I was bored, and so I went to Walmart, I got some chips and some cheese sauce, as one does, and I'm coming back to the lobby, and I see this girl, the girl of my roommate's dreams, and partly because I care about my friend and I want something good to happen to my friend, but mainly because I was bored. I go back into the room and I say, man, the girl of your dreams is in our lobby with her friends playing pool. I said, what are the odds of that? Well, the odds are one of eight because there's only eight dorm rooms at Campbell. <laughs> but I didn't say that. But I said, what are the odds of that? I said, you have got to take a chance right now. You've got to go in there. You've got to talk to her right now. He said, no, no, man, that would be weird. That would be creepy. Huh? I said, but when are you going to have another opportunity? When are you going to have another chance like this? And he kept going through all the reasons, saying no, but, but it would be this, it would be that. And, and he said, I might embarrass myself. I said, yeah, you might embarrass yourself. Or this might be the night you meet your wife. That was cheesy. I admittedly watched a few of my mom's Lifetime movies, and that's probably where I got it from. 
But I said it anyway, and that convinced him. And so we walked down the hall, and we had a plan. I was going to be like his wee man or whatever, whatever that means. And we were going to walk in there, and we are going to play it cool. We are going to pretend like we were just two, you know, cool guys playing pool. Like, that's how cool guys move. We were going to walk in and just play normal. And then after a while, he didn't talk to us. But we walked in, and he didn't do that. He made a beeline right to her. And he said, he pointed at her. And he said, don't, don't, don't I know you? Don't I know you from somewhere? And I said, oh, he blew it. I mean, wow, what a terrible line. But he didn't blow it. That's the thing. Is that he's married to her today, and they have children. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing about that story. If she were to call our bluff that night, because clearly we had ulterior motives, if she were to say, what, what led you here to this lobby? We would have said, oh, yeah, another reason just to play a pool. But she would have seen through that. And what she didn't know then, but what she would find out later, is that months ago, when he saw her for the first time, something began stirring inside of him. This kind of thing that he couldn't explain, this, this the indescribable feeling that he had for her began stirring months before he walked into that lobby. There was a kind of invisible force that was leading him there. It was not an accident that he was there. It was not random. Or maybe I've seen too many romantic comments. <laughs> what led you here today? What led you to church today? If I were to ask you that individually, if I were to say, what led you here today? You might say, well, someone in my family wanted me to come. Or if you're a child, maybe you say, well, my parents made me come. Or maybe, you know, someone offered you a ride and you came. Or maybe you were driving by the church today and you said, what the heck, let's go to church. Or maybe you came here because you genuinely wanted to worship God. But what led you here today? You see, I can see the reality that you are in your seats. Some of you are awake, some of you are sleeping, but you are here, you are sitting down. I see that, I have the truth, that is a reality, but there is an invisible kind of force that led you here this morning. There was a, a line from a, a recent news article a few months ago. It was printed in The Guardian, a UK paper, and it was just a little line. It was a story offering a historical account of an event, but there was a line that someone took a picture of, and it went viral. And the line was this. In 1965, the marriage suffered a setback when the husband was killed by the wife. <laughs> someone took a picture of that, and they said, yeah, that's a setback. <laughs> You see, that is what's printed, that's what you read, that is the reality of the story, but clearly there is something else going on there beneath the surface. Adam Smith, who is credited as being the founder of capitalism, said, we don't have to worry so much about capitalism because there is this kind of invisible hand, you remember from high school, this invisible hand that sort of guides capitalism, right? There's an invisible force that kind of guides things. Sir Isaac Newton who is credited for the with this discovery of gravity. He understood, he pointed to gravity, he said this is what it is, but he understood the what of gravity. He said there is a reality of it, but what he struggled with was the why of the gravity. In fact, he actually believed that Jesus, when he came to earth, he came here for the sole purpose of being the person who would pull the levers of gravity. The smart guy he was, but maybe, maybe he missed the mark on that one. No, no. You see, most of us, most of what we see is really just the skin of things. We see the matter, we see the outside. We see the realities. I can see you sitting in your chair, but what I can't see is inside the engine room of what brought you here, of what's stirring in your soul this morning, of what led you here today. Why are you here? What led you here this morning? Could it be that there's a force working in your favor? A few weeks before I started seminary, I drove up to my new home, this place called Durham, where they have some school there. And I was driving there, and it was pouring down rain most of the way, and the rain was ending, and I could see the sunshine in front of me, and so me and my lightweight truck at the time, I began to feel secure in driving. That was the exact moment that my car began to hydroplane. And I started spinning on I-40. I spun around three times. 
in the middle of I-40, and I do not know how I did the flip. But when the truck stopped, it stopped perpendicular to the lanes, it stopped right in the middle of I-40. My car was stalled, I couldn't even turn the engine on, I couldn't even turn the key on. I'm stuck there. It was all happening so quickly, and cars were zooming by, and, and, and they're beeping their horns at me, and there was a line of cars heading in my direction, and, and I remember just kind of looking in shock, wondering what was about to happen next, and then my truck rolled off the road onto the shoulder. And I sat there for a few minutes, just wondering what and then once I eventually got my car turned on, I began continuing my journey, this time at 50 miles an hour. <laughs> and I got back and I told people what happened. And I said, I think there, it was like something pushed me out of the way. And they said, man, you are so lucky. And I said, yeah, but it doesn't feel like luck to me. Are you here today because of luck? Is it random that you are here today? When you came here this morning, was it just all one big accident that you came here? Tina Schilling spent two decades studying what makes some people more lucky than others. And in her findings after several interviews and after lots of research, she discovered that people, that luck is not just a random lightning strike, that there's something behind that. She said that people, who make more connections in life, who take little risks here and there, particularly with people. She said people who, who, who take social risk by talking to others on an airplane or in a coffee shop. She said that people who take emotional risk by telling people you care about how you feel. She said people who take chances on others tend to be more luckier. They have more things happen to them. But do we as Christians believe in this thing called luck? Do we believe that things just randomly happen and, and there's no sense of anything? Maybe someone would like you to believe it, but that is not our faith, is it? We believe that there is a kind of invisible force at work that's not taking away our free will, but a force that is working in our favor. I believe that this researcher was on <coughs> here. I believe that she was on to something, something that Peter was also on when he wrote to this community who was being oppressed. Peter wrote to them, and he knew that this oppression that was, that was you know, clamping down the Christian community, he understood that evangelism was tantamount to the survival of the faith. And so he spoke to them about what it meant to preach the faith. But he also understood, just like you hear, that most of you here are not called to be preachers or teachers or to speak in public about your faith. Most of you are just people who are Christians. And so you know what Peter said? He said, look, we got to talk about it, but here's what you can do. Don't go making tracks and go door to door, okay? Here's what you do. When someone asks you about the distinctive hope that you have, about the distinctive joy, about the distinctive mission that you have in your life and in your heart, have a prepared response. Say, look, I have this hope because of Jesus. I have joy today because I know that this life is just the beginning. Have a prepared response on your lips to say it. But even more than that, Michael Frost says, he says, it's not just about having an answer. It's about living a life that would invoke a question. It's about living a, he calls a, a questionable <coughs> existence. He says, live a life that would inspire someone to ask you why you do what you do. If your life suddenly became an open book and a stranger was allowed to look inside and to read those pages and they could see your prayers, they could see your thoughts, they could see every action of yours, would they see anything that would inspire the world? Would they see anything that would inspire them? Would they see any actions that were so good and so unusual that they would ask you about it? But they see that in your life. Are you a questionable person? Jesus was a questionable human being. He lived a questionable life. People were always pulling him and saying, hey, i got to talk to you about this thing that just happened over here. People were saying, can I meet you at night? 
Can I meet you over here for, a, for an aside that i got to talk to you about what you said? He was a questionable person. But it wasn't just because of his teachings, which were fresh and they were compassionate and they were life-giving. It was more than that. It wasn't what he taught. It was who he believed in. It wasn't that he taught on the Sabbath. It was who he healed on the Sabbath. It was who he associated with. It was who he took a chance on. It was who he walked through that dorm, way, that dorm hallway for to talk to. He talked to the sick, the impoverished, the impressed, the sinners, those who were despised by the society that he lived in. He talked to everyone that everyone else had given up on. And because he hung out with these individuals, they questioned him but not in a good way. And so much so that they eventually crucified him. He was a questionable person, Jesus was. But Jesus never failed to take a chance on someone. When given the opportunity to take a chance on someone, he always said yes. And he takes a chance on you, and he takes a chance on me every single day. Every day I'm like, man, God really put his reputation on the line when he picked me. God really, you know, made it difficult for others to, to follow the faith when he put me in a leadership position. I don't understand it. I still don't get it. Why did God believe in me? Why does God believe in you? But that's the good news, is that God has never quit pursuing you. People who live the most interesting lives, people who live the most questionable lives are not the ones who go skydiving, although I don't understand that. They're not the ones who know the five keys to success or who make the most money. The people who live the most curious and questionable lives are the people who take chances on others. That is the greatest mystery of this earth. That a perfect in an omniscient God still believes in you, that he still believes in me, and you are here today because there is a God that still is taking a chance on you. There is a God that is still believing in you. There is a God that still has not given up on you. There are many forces at work in our world today, but by far, the persistence of God's love through the Holy Spirit is the most powerful force in our world. And it doesn't matter how you think you got here today. I can assure you, you are here because God is still pursuing you. God has not given up on you. God has not given up on me. God is believing in everyone here. And that is good news. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, help us to follow your example. Help us to believe in others the way that you believed in us. Help us to pray for others the way that you hope for us. Help us to have patience with others the way that you have patience with us, Lord. Help us to follow your example and to lead a questionable existence. Help us to be so inspired when we live here, to leave here today that we would go out into this world and the next person we see, we would choose to pray for. We would choose to believe in. We would choose to heal or bless in some way. Lord, be with us now as we prepare our hearts for the mission. In your name we pray. Amen.